Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, we're talking about three fights that you've probably had if you're in an anxious avoidant relationship, if you've been in an anxious avoidant relationship in the past, or indeed if you embark upon a relationship in the future with an anxious avoidant dynamic, you're likely to have some version of these conflicts. So for anyone who is new here, who's uninitiated in this language, when I say an anxious avoidant relationship, I'm referring to a relationship between someone who leans more anxious in their attachment style and someone who leans more avoidant in their attachment style. This is a very, very common pairing. It's very common for people with these attachment styles to be drawn to each other. And yet there can be a lot of challenges in that dynamic because, you know, on the surface, at least your attachment attachment needs and wounds tend to sit at opposite ends of the spectrum. And it's really easy if you're not conscious and not aware to just trigger the hell out of each other. Uh, and, you know, for each of your habitual responses to reinforce the other person's fears and insecurities, and thereby really embolden them in their protective mechanisms, their protective stances, and on and on it goes. So, Today's episode is really about, I suppose, normalizing some of these conflicts that you've likely had if you're in your relationship and thinking, you know, why does this feel so hard and why do we keep fighting about these things? I'm hoping that you'll feel very seen by today's episode, particularly by the specificity of some of the examples that I'm going to give. But also, I suppose, to peel back the layers in some of these conflicts, because the fight is never really about the thing that you're fighting about. It's almost always about something deeper, something symptomatic of some unmet need or some fear or insecurity that you're being brought into contact with. And our romantic relationships have a real knack for bringing us into contact with those things. And we tend to be most sensitive in that arena to anything that feels threatening to our sense of safety, our sense of self, which we derive from our relationship, at least in part. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, giving three examples. Uh, it's a little bit lighthearted. It's not intended to be a really serious conversation today. So hopefully you'll have a little chuckle and feel not only validated and, and seen, but um, maybe take it in good humor as well. That's my hope anyway. Okay. So before I dive into that, a quick reminder this is the last week that you can take advantage of the 50% off sale that I've been running um, since being on maternity leave. I'm going to wrap that up on the 30th of June. So if you are interested in saving 50% on any of my courses or masters, head to my website and you can take advantage of that with the code Hey Baby, all one word. Uh, and particularly in keeping with today's theme around anxious avoidant dynamics and navigating those and trying to build a more secure foundation within an anxious avoidant relationship relationship, which I'm a big advocate for. My course, Secure Together, which I recorded with my partner, Joel, it's a really comprehensive course that will help you and your partner, if you decide to do it together, to understand each other better and ultimately to love each other better, which is what we're all trying to do here. So um, if today's episode resonates with you, definitely check out Secure Together and save 50% with that discount code, Hey Baby. All right. So the first of these common arguments or pain points that you're likely to have encountered if you're in an anxious avoidant dynamic is an argument about details and in particular an avoidant partner not giving details about where they're going what they're doing uh, being sort of vague or cagey at least that's how it's likely to appear to the anxious person about it might be where they're going it might be who they're talking to it might be who's going to be somewhere so you know to paint the picture a little your partner might be you know catching up with friends on the weekend and you know you the anxious partner might ask them oh, where are you going to go? And your avoidant partner might say, oh, I'm not sure yet, full stop. And you might then say, what do you mean you're not sure yet? Oh, I just don't know. We haven't made a plan or I don't know. I'm not the one organizing it. And you might then say to the anxious partner, well, haven't you asked them, how do you know where you're going to meet them? And you might sense your avoidant partner becoming increasingly agitated with the line of questioning. You might then pivot to, well, who's going to be there? And they might say, I don't know. And similarly, you might say, well, what do you mean you don't know? That kind of level of back and forth around giving details or not giving details. So why might this be triggering? For someone with more anxious attachment patterns, certainty and information and details allow you to feel some level of control, right? Uh, vagaries and uncertainty and blank space is a total breeding ground for your anxiety. And particularly in circumstances like the one that I've just walked through, you're likely to go to a worst case scenario of they're hiding something from me. Um, they're 
you know, cheating on me. There's going to be someone there that they shouldn't be seeing all of these things. And now I want to be really clear because I I know I'll get people saying, but what if that's true? And what if I've had that experience? And I'm not at all meaning to invalidate those fears to the extent that they, you know, are grounded in reality. Um, I'm really talking here just about that dynamic of anxious partner really wanting a lot of information, needing that information to feel safe. And so grilling their partner or kind of interrogating their partner, continuing to like peck and go back in for more and push and press. And then finding resistance in their partner and using the fact of that resistance as evidence that there's something being hidden or concealed. And so escalating that attempt to, you know, draw blood from a stone to pull out information from them. Uh, and, you know, again, on and on that spirals because you're convinced that they're deliberately concealing or hiding something from you. Now, why would that be an issue for the avoidant partner? Why would the avoidant partner not just give you all of the details that you want? So let's kind of walk around to the other side and look at things from their perspective. We know that avoidant partners really value their privacy, their independence, their sense of autonomy. They will often, particularly earlier in a relationship, be quite protective of different parts of their life and keep them quite siloed. So say they were going to a work function, they might not want to give you all of the details about that. And they might deliberately keep that kind of vague because they don't think that it's relevant for you to know. They don't understand why you would need to know all of that because that's a different part of their life. Now, I understand that if you're more anxious, that just doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't really make sense to me either as someone who does tend more in that direction and would freely give that information. But I suppose the point is that it's not always sinister, right? It's not always uh, concealing something because there's something to hide that is dishonesty or some sort of betrayal or other breach of trust, sometimes avoidant leaning partners just don't see why it's necessary for you to know. And keeping that kind of buffer can be a way of protecting their energetic space um, and kind of keeping a level of autonomy rather than feeling intruded upon and feeling like you are seeking to insert yourself into every aspect of their life. So there can be this sense of, you know, a safe distance that they maintain by keeping details vague, by not being really oversharing about every little aspect of other parts of their life that they don't necessarily see as being relevant to you. Now, that's not to say that you have to be okay with that. So on both sides, anxious partner doesn't have to just be okay with vague detail, uh, with not being included in other aspects of their partner's life or being, you know, kept at arm's length. I think particularly as a relationship goes on, it's totally understandable that you would want to be included in different aspects of each other's lives and feel like you have at least some level of insight into that rather than feeling like you're being kept away. But equally, I think that having the understanding around where that might be coming from can allow you to approach the conversation to the extent that you feel you need to have a conversation from a more compassionate place rather than an accusatory one. Because I can assure you that if you go in with an accusation, essentially, you know, what are you hiding from me? Why won't you tell me? Then your partner's only going to retreat further, feel even more intruded upon uh, and And that's going to exacerbate the dynamic. Now, from the avoidant partner's perspective, I think, you know, your work here in this kind of argument is to understand that the more you give, the less your partner's going to go into that mode of intruding upon you or, you know, interrogating you, which is probably how you feel. I use that word kind of loosely or in inverted commas, um, because I know that that's how you're likely to feel as the more avoidant partner. Like, why are you harassing me? Why do you need to know this doesn't concern you? That protective stance that you're kind of adopting there is actually making it worse. So if you can see things from your partner's perspective and understand that that little bit of extra detail or informational context provides a lot of safety to relax into giving you your space without needing to feel like they have to investigate, you know, pry you open for information. Um, That's, you know, a really nice and I would say relatively easy give uh, that will actually, you know, your fear story probably tells you that that's going to be some slippery slope and then you're never going to have any privacy or time or space to yourself again. It's usually the opposite outcome. You'll actually have more freedom, more time and space to yourself because your partner's not going to be so paranoid. Okay. 
The next fight that you've probably had some variation of is if you're already having a fight or a a serious conversation about something and the avoidant partner is starting to get restless, as will often happen, uh, and then they say something along the lines of, it's not a good time or I have to get back to work or I have to go and do something. And so they essentially like abruptly leave the serious conversation because they've got some other thing to do. Now, if you're the anxious partner and you were already upset or worked up and then your partner says, I've got to go and do this work thing and goes and gets their laptop out and starts doing something else, that's going to feel incredibly rejecting and dismissive, right? It's going to feel like how could you possibly be thinking about something else? How can you just switch gears like that? You must not care about this thing that we're talking about at all. You know, you're just trying to come up with some excuse to get out of this conversation. Um, and so for the anxious partner, that's probably going to fire you up and you're probably going to follow them or just be really, really upset and hurt and possibly angry at your partner for just disengaging like that. And you're going to feel really deprioritized. Like if you cared about me, uh, you wouldn't be going to do that thing. You'd be staying and having this conversation with me, right? Uh, For the avoidant partner, there can be this sense of like, this conversation is going to go on for three hours. I don't have time or capacity for it. It's not productive. We're not getting anywhere. We're just talking around in circles. And so I'm going to go and do the thing that I was meant to be doing at this point in time. And that for them is a perfectly logical kind of rational response to allocating their time and energy. They're not doing that to deliberately reject or hurt their partner. If anything, they're extracting themselves with a view to keeping the conflict at bay a lot of the time or not letting things escalate to the point of full-blown conflict, big emotions, things that they don't really feel comfortable with. Uh, And so in nipping something in the bud or kind of shifting gears, extracting themselves, taking themselves out of the conversation, albeit at maybe a kind of insensitive or inopportune moment, oftentimes it's just their effort at either self-regulating, whether they realize it or not, at preserving some semblance of peace and connection or really just doing the thing that they were meant to do. You know, if they are genuinely working to a deadline, um, that might be as important, if not more important to them than having some big drawn out relationship conversation. Again, if you're more anxious, that's kind of unfathomable because big drawn out relationship conversations will always come first, right? You would happily, you know, cancel your plans and push back a deadline or be late for something if something big was happening in your relationship. And that needed to be discussed. That's always going to take precedence for you. Um, and you know, you would happily kind of drop everything else to stay in that until you find the resolution that you're looking for. That's just not true for your avoidant partner. A lot of the time they don't have that same hierarchy where the relationship just sits like so far above everything else that nothing else matters. And so recognizing that, that, divergence in approach and how you view a conversation like that and the boundaries and time parameters and and kind of staying in it, the presence, again, is not coming from a place of like a lack of caring or a deliberate attempt at hurting one another, but there are some little tweaks that you can do there to try and prevent that from escalating. Because as I said, there's a good chance if the avoidant partner does extract themselves that the anxious partner is going to fire up and really you know, amplify their attempts at being heard, whether that's by getting nasty or getting really emotional, um, you know, saying, you don't even care about me, what's wrong with you, I can't do this anymore, all of those sorts of things, which again, tend not to help really. Um, they're, you know, really understandable and oftentimes coming from a place of desperation at being seen and heard. Like if I can just get you to understand how much I'm hurting, then you'll come to me, then you'll change, then you'll behave differently. And it can be so upsetting when that doesn't work because obviously we then tell ourselves, well, you don't care. So what can we do about this kind of fight? I think a really good starting point is not having those conversations unless you've got the time and space for them. So really getting an opt-in from your partner. Do you have time to talk about X thing? So you're not kind of ambushing them when they are in the middle of something or when it's not a good time, uh, when they're then likely to get kind of uncomfortable and restless and impatient with the conversation because they weren't in the headspace to have it in the first place. And so I think being respectful of their time and energy when you're having these conversations rather than just launching into something when your partner feels kind of backed against a wall, because that's going to naturally lead them to want to find the exit. And then that's going to trigger you. So 
being respectful at the outset and finding a mutually workable time to have conversations, I think is really a good rule of thumb in any relationship. I would also say, hey, you know, if your partner does start to get restless, agitated, start to kind of pull away or withdraw or start to come up with these, you know, reasons why they can't continue the conversation, rather than jumping to accusation or blame, maybe say, okay, I understand that when would be a good time for us to finish this conversation off because it's really important to me. I know that you've got to do X, Y, Z thing. Maybe you just need to cool off and that's actually really valid and sensible, I would say. Remembering that there is no point in pushing through a conversation when one or both of you are really dysregulated and that's really hard for the anxious partner who just wants to like bulldoze through at all costs until you find your way to that resolution. But when you're both kind of worked up in your own way, you're very rarely going to find yourself to a genuine kind of resolution to that conflict. You're not able to hear or see each other. So um, respecting that if your partner is needing to pull away from the conversation, that that's actually probably sensible and wise and giving them the space to go and regulate with the caveat of, okay, what do I need out of that? What do I need in order to feel comfortable with you taking that space? Well, I need some assurance that we're going to revisit this. Can you please let me know? when works for you to do that. Maybe it's later today, maybe it's tomorrow, whatever, but it's going to be much easier for you to let them go if you know that they're going to come back at some point and you're going to get what you need. Um, And as a little footnote to that, very sensible for you in that time apart, if you do take that space to go and regulate yourself as well, rather than just, you know, sitting on your bed crying and rehearsing what you're going to say to them, because that's only going to get you more and more worked up. Okay. The third and final fight that you've probably had. I'm sure I could have done an episode with about 50 of these, but I'm going to leave it at three for today is around love languages. So I've done an episode on love languages before, and I've mentioned it here and there. If you're not familiar with the term, I'm sure most of you are, but basically that we each have our own ways of giving and receiving love that are most natural to us, that we you know, give love, show love in those ways, and that we perceive others' actions as loving. We feel really loved when people demonstrate their love in particular ways. And so for anxiously attached people, I mean, I always kind of joke that I think like anxious people can identify with all of the love languages almost because they tend to really want to express love and to have love expressed towards them. It's almost like this bottomless pit of you know, expressiveness around love and affection and care and, and desire in both directions. Um, but particularly words of affirmation being like given a verbal reassurance that you are loved and cared for and, you know, getting compliments, those sorts of things are likely to really feel very nourishing and reassuring to the anxious partner. Um, you know, physical affection is another big one. Um, and so what we often see in anxious avoidant couples is once again, we tend to have quite different love languages. So for more avoidant folks, you'll tend to see less of those direct shows of affection, like words of affirmation, physical affection, physical touch, and more kind of action-based things, more what we might say indirect. So acts of service, quality time, gift giving as well can be one for, for avoidant folks. So What you might see and, you know, a common fight that you might have had is around these differences in love languages. So for anxious folks, you probably want your partner to be more expressive, to say, I love you more, to say like, you know, you mean so much to me or you look beautiful or, you know, I don't know what I'd do without you or these sorts of things, right? Just like getting that verbal reassurance. And you probably don't get heaps of that. From most avoidant partners, that's probably not going to come naturally to them and um, being so openly expressive about their feelings towards you. And so they might not be very you know, heavy handed on giving out compliments or, or you know, giving out those um, words of affirmation, terms of endearment, probably not their thing. And so you might've had some sort of conflict around that. Likewise, you know, around affection, you might reach out and like hold their hand and they might pull their hand back. You might give them a hug and they might kind of stiffen in your arms, stand there and then pull away. And that might feel very rejecting for you, understandably. On the flip side of that, you might find that more avoidant partners really want to spend like quality time together. And for them, you know, quality time is likely doing activities together, doing new things together, like being out in the world together. And they might get quite restless at the idea of just hanging out at home together, for example, Um, you know, not doing anything novel or exciting. I'm kind of being in a bubble together is probably not going to meet that need. And so you've probably had some variation of conflict around 
these different ways of showing love. And oftentimes it will be the anxious partner. You can see a theme here. Often the anxious partner is the one, I don't want to say initiating the conflict, but I suppose expressing the the need or the sense of lack or the sense that there's an issue that needs addressing. Um, and that might be around like, you never tell me you love me or you don't even find me attractive or those sorts of things. And when an avoidant partner hears that, uh, particularly if they've been making an effort to show love in their own way, so via acts of service, via, you know, spending time together, they're likely to hear that as just like, oh, nothing I do is enough, right? I try and do all of these things and you're just over here telling me that I haven't done that thing or I haven't done enough of it. Uh, and you're asking me to do something that doesn't come naturally to me. And for avoidant people, there's this real sensitive point around I don't want to have to do something where I feel forced. So I don't want to have to pretend to feel something that I don't feel. I don't want to say something that doesn't feel sincere or authentic, uh, that feels kind of scripted and awkward to me. They're likely to have a big aversion to things like that. I don't want to you know, engage in physical affection that feels unnatural and, and uncomfortable. So um, recognizing that there is this aversion to doing that which doesn't come naturally for the appointed partner. It's very much out of their comfort zone and they're likely to be very resistant to it, which is why they're you know, more inclined to stick to their more comfortable ways of showing love. Um, but you may well have had some conflict around you know, expressions of love and love languages. Now, what to do with that? I really recommend if if that is you, then going to listen to the episode around love languages. From memory, we also cover love languages specifically in the Secure Together course that I mentioned earlier I and, mean, you know, how to navigate those. But I think once again, we have to give our partner the benefit of the doubt on both sides. Like what's the most generous interpretation of this? And that's not going to be, well, my partner just doesn't give a shit about me. They just don't care about me. <laughs> um, can I find my way to a more generous interpretation? Can I try to reorient myself from uh, this really strong negative bias to seeing you know, how my partner does show up for me and making sure that they know that, making sure that they feel really acknowledged again on both sides, because the more we shift to that kind of culture of appreciation and acknowledgement, the more safety there's going to be and the more likely we are to be able to then take risks because vulnerability doesn't feel so frightening. If we're in a culture of blame and accusation and attack and defensiveness, vulnerability is a really big ask <laughs> against that backdrop because we feel like we're in constant self-protection. So if you can find a way to shift that culture, shift the relational environment towards something that is more positive um, and appreciative, then you may just find that your partner is more willing to meet you in the middle or take those risks, step out of their comfort zone because you've created a really secure foundation for them to do that. Okay. So I hope that that's been helpful for you. As I said, I hope that you've felt seen, validated maybe by aspects of those. And even if it's not a carbon copy of those exact fights that you might, you know, see aspects of yourself and your partner, or maybe an ex-partner in the dynamics that I've spoken to that can sit underneath those surface level fights. So hopefully that's given you a little bit more compassion and empathy for your partner and also some greater conscious awareness about what drives your own triggers and so that you don't just have to do a rinse and repeat of those painful arguments that tend to drive you further and further apart rather than bringing you closer together, which is of course what we're trying to do. And as I said, uh, if you want to go deeper on that kind of conversation, Secure Together is a really great course, particularly so because Joel is kind of co-teaching it with me. And so he's there in all of the videos, giving the avoidant perspective directly. Um, I've had so much beautiful feedback from people's avoidant partners um, who've really loved that and felt that it's been really balanced and so has felt less intimidating for them. It's not just being lectured to by someone who's on team anxious. It's actually really trying to give a voice to both perspectives with a view to helping you understand each other. So um, there's a few more days to get 50% of that course if you are interested and you can do so via the links in the show notes or heading straight to my website. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. So appreciative of you all always. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks guys.